What's up, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Da Vinci Cases. All right, so the way this works is we've got a clinical case followed by a board style question. So we're going to go through the question stem, point out the relevant clinical findings, take a look at the question and the answer choices, and then kind of divert for a minute and go through the relevant concepts to answering the question. Then we'll come back and apply those concepts that we went over to answering the question. Hey, everybody, welcome back to Da Vinci Cases. This is GI case nine. This is the first GI pharmacology case. So for this case, we have a 53-year-old woman with a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and peptic ulcer disease, presenting with persistent epigastric pain. So this is a middle-aged woman. She's got some cardiovascular risk factors, and then she also has history of peptic ulcer disease, um, which is likely is the etiology of her epigastric pain. She has tried over-the-counter antiacid medications for the past two months, which have provided little relief. So she's tried some over-the-counter meds. They're just not working. So her primary care physician prescribes her omeprazole for her peptic ulcer disease. So her physician is then prescribing her, you know, a stronger medication to help treat her symptoms. And so the question is, which of the following is the mechanism of action of omeprazole? And you have a series of answer choices here that have different mechanisms of action. So before we answer the question, you know, even though this is a farm case and often the stems are short, it's always good to kind of put together what the question is getting at. So this is a middle-aged woman with persistent epigastric pain, most likely secondary to peptic ulcer disease. Her symptoms are resistant to antacid therapy. So she's being started on, in this case, a proton pump inhibitor therapy, which is omeprazole. So the correct answer is inhibition of the hydrogen potassium ATPase, which is found in gastric parietal cells. So this is a diagram of a gastric parietal cell. And up here you have the sodium potassium ATPase, you know, exchanging extracellular potassium for, for intracellular sodium, which is found in, you know, virtually every cell in the body. Then down here, which is uh, sort of unique to gastric parietal cells, you have the hydrogen potassium exchanger or pump. And so what that does is it pumps hydrogen out of the gastric parietal cell into the stomach lumen in exchange for a potassium. And so this is how you get acid into the stomach lumen. Then you also have these chloride channels, which pump chloride into the lumen as well. So you have hydrochloric acid or HCl, which again is that acid that helps you know break down uh, digested products in the stomach. What you also have is this histamine or H2 receptor up here, which binds to histamine. And then by binding that receptor, you stimulate this G protein coupled receptor or GS, which then stimulates the conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP. And cyclic AMP actually stimulates the hydrogen potassium ATPase. So when it comes to therapies for peptic ulcer disease, is you're essentially kind of trying to treat the acid here. And so you can give antacids, which are over-the-counter meds often. And what they do is they essentially, you know, they're ions that bind to the hydrogen and neutralize it. So you can try those. In the case of this patient, that didn't work. You can also give what's called a proton pump inhibitor. And it does exactly what it sounds like it does. It inhibits the hydrogen potassium ATPase or the proton pump. You can also give H2 blockers, which block the H2 receptor, which block histamine from binding that receptor and triggering production of cyclic AMP, which stimulates the hydrogen potassium ATPase. So it's essentially kind of an indirect blocker, if you will, of the hydrogen potassium pump here. So this whole slide gives a, an overview of peptic ulcer disease treatment. So you have antiacids, um, which again are often over the counter. And in the case, this case here, the patient tried those and they didn't work. Some examples of those are aluminum hydroxide, calcium carbonate, and magnesium hydroxide. So as you can see, these all contain anions, such as hydroxide, carbonate, that can then bind to the acid and then neutralize it. So some side effects, you know, these often show up on exams, especially in pharmacology questions. So all of the above can cause hypokalemia, specifically aluminum hydroxide. Now, which each one of these, you got to remember, these are actually relevant to the relevant ions involved. So aluminum actually can cause constipation and hypophosphatemia. Uh, if you have hypophosphatemia, remember that can affect muscle contraction because you need phosphate for ATP, so you can get muscle weakness. Remember, phosphate's a key component of bone structure, so you can get osteodystrophy, and it can also affect CNS function and give you seizures. Calcium carbonate, again, if you take too much of it, you can get hypercalcemia and also get a rebound increase in acid. And then lastly, magnesium hydroxide, specifically magnesium, can cause diarrhea. Uh, it can also cause hyporeflexia, hypotension, and even cardiac arrhythmias if you take way too much of it. Now, proton pump inhibitors, the examples of these are 
omeprazole. So you got to remember these ones, a lot of these medications, these classes of drugs, they have kind of a similar ending. So for, in this case, you have prazole. So all of these end in prazole. So if you hear prazole, that's your cue to know it's a proton pump inhibitor. So omeprazole, lansoprazole, esmeprazole, pantoprazole, dexlanoprazole. And again, the side effects for these, the main ones you want to remember is they increase the risk for C. diff infection actually and pneumonia. And then the last ones here are the H2 blockers. So examples of these, again, these all have kind of a similar ending as well, which is uh, tididine or T-I-D-I-N-E. So cimetidine, renatidine, famatidine, and nizatidine. Specifically, cimetidine has some side effects you should remember. One, it inhibits the cytochrome P450, which has a number of you know, drug interactions and side effects within itself. It also has anti-androgenic effects. So that can lead to gynecomastia, impotence, and decreased libido in males. It's also able to cross the blood-brain barrier, and so it can cause confusion, dizziness, and headaches. It can also cause decreased renal excretion of creatinine, um, which is also a side effect of renatidine. So both cimetidine and renatidine can, all, can decrease renal excretion of creatinine. So if we come back to the question here, just running through the answer choices here. So inhibiting the sodium potassium ATPase, you know, usually that's actually not too compatible with life. The one kind of example, exception to that is, is a drug called digoxin. Uh, which is actually used to treat heart failure. And there's a very narrow therapeutic window for giving digoxin. It's only given in certain cases. And it, the dose of it is tightly, tightly regulated for that reason, because it's uh, it's given in these very unique scenarios for heart failure. It's not necessarily the first line of treatment for heart failure. So again, our answer is in inhibiting the hydrogen potassium ATPA, specifically in gastric parietal cells. And again, this is for proton pump inhibitors. And then the mechanism of H2 blockers is an H2 receptor antagonist. And then lastly, neutralization of acid, that's the mechanism of action of antiacids. So this is a patient with persistent peptic ulcer causing persistent epigastric pain that failed with over-the-counter conservative antiacid medications. And so now she's trying omeprazole, which is a proton pump inhibitor to help alleviate her symptoms. All right, that's all I have for you this time. Be sure to check out all the DaVinci Cases videos available on our YouTube channel and our website, dviacademy.com. The PDF notes for every DaVinci Cases is also available on our website. Also be sure to check out our podcast, The DaVinci Hour, 